Good morning, y'all. Can't tell if this mic is live yet. Are we working properly? Thank you. Okay, sorry for um, running a little bit late here, but this is the last uh, week that I'll be uh, teaching Psalms next week. Chuck Hickman is going to be teaching uh, our, our practice here lately in the summer times as we go a month at a time, so Chuck will be here next. But we're going to wrap up with Psalm 69. And like I've showed this slide every every class that the purpose of teaching Psalms is of this whole little uh, little session was first of all gain an appreciation of Psalms. You know, you know, for me specifically, a true confession moment. Psalms are not a particular favorite, but by studying and spending some times some time in the Psalms, that's that's how you gain an appreciation for any aspect of the word. Uh, it's easy not to uh, to say that, well, yeah, I don't really like Bible study. Well, it's easy if you don't spend some time in it, but to spend some time in it, you gain an appreciation. So that's what I'm that's what I'm personally hoping to get, and I hope that you as well, some appreciation, a better appreciation of the Psalms. Um, today specifically, uh, this Psalm, Psalm 69, we'll be looking at how it's used in the New Testament, and it's used extensively in the New Testament, the seven different uh, times that pieces of Psalm 69 gets, gets used. And then the overall objective, and I'd say the main objective, is use the writings of the, of the psalmists to increase our trust and understanding of, of God and how he works. So specifically in uh, what we looked at so far in Psalm 103, it was a psalm uh, praising God for his uh, love and compassion and the phrase his steadfast love endures forever, or his faithful love endures forever. That 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 opens it up, and that's really the key theme that gets that that gets that weighs throughout the entire psalm. Uh, specifically, it speaks on those who fear him, who, who, those who fear God, and and their fear leads them to trust and follow and obey him. It it, it talks about forget none of his benefits. Those of you who fear God, don't, don't forget the good things that he's done in your lives. Don't forget the good things he's done in the community of God's people. That was Psalm 103. And then we went to 107, which is also a, song of, uh, a psalm of praise. But it, it looks at from the viewpoint of four different groups of Israelites who are suffering in captivity. And for each one of them, it kind of follows the uh, familiar recipe of... They cried out to the Lord in their distress, for their particular distress, and he delivers them, and then in, in thanks. Their response is thanks for his steadfast love. Uh, some, of the, some of them are in captivity, and, and it's a result of their own sin and their own disobedience. Others just, just find themselves in that predicament. But they all end up thanking God for, their, uh, for his steadfast love and deliverance. And then last week we talked about Psalm 73. Uh, interesting little psalm uh, written by Asaph. Uh, he had become, uh, he was one of God's um, the Levitical singers who at the uh, inauguration of, I guess you'd say, uh, the opening of the, of the original temple, he sang uh, one of three key singers who sang at the altar there. And, but he became disillusioned with seeing all the wickedness that was going on around them. And he, and he says in the second verse, my feet had almost slipped, my steps, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped. And he, and he goes on to describe what caused him to descend into that, that dark place where his faith was, was slipping away from him until he entered into the sanctuary of God. And he comes to realize, and, and, and for him, entering into the sanctuary of God is literally going into the, the, you know, the temple built by Solomon and, and offering praises to God, God. And in that worship time, he, he comes to understand that uh, they're gonna, the wicked are going to get their just rewards in the end. And he closes with, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So Psalm 69, it's a, it's, a, it's a psalm of David, and it's a plea to God for deliverance from affliction. And as you'll see, it's, he's made some mistakes along the way, but others around him are taking advantage and oppressing him to the point where he feels like he's drowning. Uh, that's, that's some of the 
more descriptive language he used right at the opening. But he trusts that God's going to vindicate him. And as we're going to see, the psalm is frequently cited in the New Testament pieces of it. Uh, Jesus, Paul, Peter, John, all those writers quote uh, from, uh, from, from, from David's psalm here, Psalm 69. So in outline form, the first four verses talking about save me, O God. He speaks in the context of drowning. And then he talks about that, why is he in this situation? Well, he's in this situation because he is bearing the reproaches for the sake of God. He's, he's, he's feeling the wrath of others. He's feeling the cruelty of others because he has stood up for God. In, in the context of that, he's made some mistakes, but his motivation was to, was to uphold God and God's, and God's law. Then is a prayer of deliverance, and towards the end he closes with uh, asking God to uh, let your anger overtake them, let your anger be fulfilled against these people who are who are wronging me, and finally he closes with praises for the name of God. So that's kind of an outline of it. So what I'll do, just this is the pattern I've been following all four weeks, is we'll read through the entire psalm, then we'll kind of dig into it piece by piece. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I've come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. I'm weary with my crying out. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting for my God. More in number than the hairs of my head are those who hate me without cause. Mighty are those who would destroy me, those who would attack me with lies. What I did not steal must I now restore? O God, you know my folly. The wrongs I have done are not hidden from you. Let not those who hope in you be put to shame through me, O Lord God of hosts. Let not those who seek you be brought to dishonor through me, O O God of Israel. For it is for your sake that I have borne reproach, that dishonor has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's sons. For zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. When I wept and humbled my soul with fasting, it became my reproach. When I made sackcloth my clothing, I became a byword to them. I am the talk of those who sit at the gate, and the drunkards make songs about me. But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, at an acceptable time, O God, and the abundance of your steadfast love Answer me in your saving faithfulness. Deliver me from sinking in the mire. Let me be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters. Let not the flood sweep over me or the deep swallow me up or the pit close its mouth over me. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercy, turn to me. Hide not your face from your servant, for I am in distress. Make haste to answer me. Draw near to my soul, redeem me, ransom me because of my enemies. You know my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. My foes are all known to you. Reproaches have broken my heart so that I am in despair. I looked for pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. They gave me poison for food, and for my thirst they gave me sour wine to drink. Let their own table before me, before them become a snare. And when they are at peace, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and make their loins tremble continually. Pour out your indignation upon them and let your burning anger overtake them. May their camp be a desolation. Let no one dwell in their tents. For they persecute him whom you have struck down and they recount the pain of those you have wounded. Add to them punishment upon punishment. May they have no acquittal from you. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living. Let them not be enrolled among the righteous. But I am afflicted and in pain. Let your salvation, O God, set me on high. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox or a bull with horns and hoofs. When the humble see it, they will be glad. You who seek God, let your hearts revive. For the Lord hears the needy and does not despise his own people who are prisoners. Let heaven and earth praise him, 
the seas and everything that moves in them. For God will save Zion and build up the cities of Judah, and people will dwell there and possess it. The offspring of his servants shall inherit it, and those who love his name shall dwell in it. So I failed to lay down the challenge uh, early on. I meant to before I started reading that to you Bible scholars to see how many New Testament quotations you could pick out. But there's, there's seven of them. Um, I'll, I'll give you a warning now so you can kind of be picking those out as, as we go through. See if, see if you can, how many of those you can find. But as you, as you start out in the psalm, you know, he's clearly making uh, a, a very poetic description about how, um, how he's drowning, how, he, how overwhelmed he is uh, uh, by, by the events that are going on around him to the point of it's, it's a plea of desperation that he's making. And he talks about the waters coming up to his neck, no foothold, sinking in the deep mire, uh, in, in deep waters, and the flood sweeping over. A very poetic description of where he's at right now. And then he moves on to talking about, about why. Uh, he talks a couple of verses there about his condition, about his, he, 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 he opened up with his feelings, and then he talks about his status of crying out to God and, 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 and seemingly going unanswered. But then he, in verse 4, starting in verse 4, he, he gives us some insight. What's, what's bringing on these feelings of, of being overwhelmed? Uh, those who hate me without cause, uh, those who would destroy me, those who would attack me with lies. He's being uh, attacked probably from his fe fellow Israelites, uh, particularly if you know the history of David, probably from his fe fellow Israelites who have turned on him and, and, are, and are persecuting him and pursuing him. Uh, and that's what's making him feel so burdened and so, so that uh, feeling like he's about to go under, that he can't bear this anymore. And, and incidentally, we also have our first quote uh, from the New Testament on this. Those who hate me without cause. Uh, Jesus quotes this uh, when he's speaking. He, he speaks it in the context of the, of the world's reaction and how the world is going to hate those who follow Jesus. So if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now... They have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without cause. So Jesus quotes from the Psalm of David, Psalm 69. Um, and, and in doing so, he kind of, he's kind of establishing a parallel with what, with what Jesus is going through, with what his uh, disciples are going through, and what... David went through. He's establishing, uh, you know, some similarities there. In, in Jesus' case, he talks, you know, we, we know this from the life of Jesus and, and from his own message he just gave here. He's speaking of the things that he is, has happened to him. He's been unjustly accused even by those, even by those who claim to be followers of God, even by the religious among them. He's experiencing uh, persecution and, and unjust accusation. Uh, and in Jesus' case, he's being hated by those who simply do not want their evil deeds or their their, uh, their own inner uh, sinful workings held up to the light. That's the motivation that's behind them. They don't like the things that he's saying. It's, make, it's putting them in a bad light. So they turn on him. The world responds violently to those who would shine the light of, line the light of truth on them. Uh, Speak about more about that in just a second. In David's context, you know, we don't know entirely what, what precipitated this reaction 
from David, but he's being assaulted by lies and personal attacks. Uh, and he tells us he's, it's, he's doing so, the, or the people are responding so, because he has upheld God's word. He has, he has stood up for God, uh, and he is desperate, uh, feels like he's drowning, and he's feeling to the point where he's crying out to God, he's not getting any answer. I would contend that Jesus' promise to us today that we can find parallels in the life of Jesus and in the life of David. Since Jesus is quoting from David and drawing a similarity there between his affliction and David's, I would argue that, that Jesus is also, by extension, saying that if the persecution that's promised to us today is going to be, we can, we can draw similarities to what Jesus experienced and what David experienced. You know, just the, the things that are going on in our nation uh, around us, you know, the, that's Christians, we're going to be persecuted more. If we stand up for God's word, we will be persecuted more. It's going to happen. That's where we're at. Not only did God promise it, just look around you. Just look around you and see what's, what's happening in our own country in this world. And know for a fact that we will be persecuted. And how's it going to feel? It's going to feel like you're drowning. It's going to feel like you're in over your head. It's going to feel overwhelming. We're going to experience times we're going to cry out to God. And we're not going to get an immediate answer that comforts us. We're going to be assaulted by lies and personal attacks. This is what's coming. This is what's promised to us. So pay attention to what David's saying and where he gets to in his ultimate trust of God that I don't like what's happening to me, God. I don't like it at all, but I trust, I trust that you're going to vindicate and you will, and you will uphold me, God. Uh, that's basically the same message that Jesus has, by the way. Trust. Trust in God. He will be with you uh, throughout this. So let's go on the rest. Where he speaks of, in this passage here, David makes some allusion to that he, he recognizes that he's not perfect. He recognizes that he's made some ma mistakes along the way. He confesses to God that the wrongs I have done are, are not hidden to you. And he, and he speaks of, he, he makes this prayer that, I hope the things I've done don't bring any shame upon you, God. He makes that allusion a couple times. There's another verse a little bit later, we'll see, where he also makes this allusion to the things that, that he's done, he recognizes he's done some wrong. Uh, Dave is not, David is not pure in this. That, that does separate him a bit from uh, uh, Jesus, right? Uh, David has some mistakes that he's made. Uh, Jesus, I don't think you can make that, that claim. But like us, uh, in upholding God's word, we're going to make some mistakes. We're going we're gonna to do some things wrong. We're going to offend some people. And there's going to be some times where we're going to have some self-doubt about, am, am I doing? Am I doing right? Um, and and <laughs> in fact, be, in fact of the matter, we're probably not going to do it all right. Uh, that's part of what David's recognizing here. But, but David's motivation was to uphold the honor of God and the, and the word of God. For your sake, it's for your sake, God, that I've borne reproach. It's, he says, the zeal for your house has consumed me. Uh, that is what the underlying motivator is that's, that's, that's moving David. And he's made mistakes along the way. But, but, but at least he has a good motivation. He, he's coming from a motivation of trying to uh, uphold the name of God. And incidentally, that is another of our, our New Testament quotes. Zeal for your house has consumed me. And do you remember where that's used in the New Testament? That's spoken of, uh, it's quoted of Jesus when he clears out the temple. Uh, it speaks about, well, I'll just read starting in John 2, uh, verse 13. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. 
And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume him. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? And he answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you'll raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So, in zeal for God's house is what, is what consumed uh, Jesus. And it must have been quite a sight, not only dr- driving out the people and overturning tables as it sells elsewhere, but also driving out the sheep and the oxen. And wow, what a, what a sight that must have been, right? But zeal for God's house caused Jesus to take actions that are earning him some enemies. <laughs> the people, the money changers, didn't appreciate it. Jesus has nothing to appreciate for, but, but he's zealously pursuing what is right. He is upholding his God's house. Let not his father's house become a, a place of commerce. It's a holy place for worshiping the Lord God. And it was being used for common, uh, nothing illegal that, that we're reading about going on there, but for, but for, but for common purposes and, and not upholding the name of the Father. Similarly, David was earning the reproach from others for, for the things that he, whatever it was, whatever he was doing to uphold God was earning him the, the wrath of others. And that's part of the message here is that's going to go hand in hand with upholding the word of God. When, you, when, we, when we take an active role in shining God's light, there are certainly going to be those who are drawn positively to the light, but there are also going to be those who are going to flinch from the light, who are going to push back we're going to fight back at the idea of God's light. It happened in Jesus' time. It happened in David's time. It's going to happen. It is happening in our time. This is part of, this is human nature. This is, this is God's plan. This is the way it works. And so Christians, this true disciples of God, expect this and don't draw back from it. Don't, don't. Turn aside from from conscientiously doing God's will and upholding God's will just because because you get pushback. There's a second quote uh, that also comes from the same passage. Of, in, Psalm, in verse 9 he says, The reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. And Paul uses this in, uh, in Romans. Uh, Romans 15, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Maybe it's just me, but that's a passage I need to think through a little bit. It doesn't readily... What does that mean? That, that, that's one I struggle with a little bit. The reproaches of those who reproach you fell on me. And Paul used it in a slightly different context. Where David is using it, David is saying the same people who rebuke God, who turn their backs to God, they're the ones who are rebuking me. The reproaches of those who reproach you are reproach me. I'm, I'm feeling the, the wrath of the same, the same bunch. That's how David used it. But Paul uses it in a little different context. Paul's using this in the context of Christ putting others' needs ahead of his own. Christ bore the reproaches. He bore the punishment of those who reproached God. We have sinned against God... And Christ bore that punishment, that reproachment. That's the way Paul uses it. 
And he's saying that in, 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 in that context that we should also bear the, the reproaches, the, the, the burdens, the... Um, I'm struggling for the right word there. Bear the, the difficulties that are borne by our weak brothers. Those that are weaker than us are, go, are having a harder time. Those of us are strong in the, in the same, uh, in imitation of Christ, step up and help them with it. But help bear with their failings, tolerate their failings, um, be patient with their failings, I guess is the best way I can phrase it off the top of my head. But he's using Christ as that example. But again, using a little different context than David did. Uh, David's was uh, clearly looking at uh, the people who were coming down on us, uh, coming down on him, are those who turn their backs on God. That's a good message for us too, to understand. Those who, uh, as we go about our, 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 our Christian walk and upholding the word of God, those who come down on us, never forget, by and large, it's those who are, who are also turning their backs on God. So, Take that encouragement. When he talks here about then the outcome, David's outcome of this is in, in bearing the reproach of others. He's become a byword. He's become the talk of those who sit at the gate. Who's it, who's it who sit at the gate? It's the, it's the elders of the community who sit at the gate. Um, he's the talk of, 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 of those and and even the drunkards in town make songs about him. He is the he is quite the topic of discussion uh, from those who evil doers to even uh, to all ranges of the community. Uh, he becomes the, the 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 topic, and he's feeling the reproach uh, of of others around him. But his prayer is that he be delivered. Um, that he be delivered from his enemies. Uh, and there's desperation. There's desperation in this prayer. But as for me, I, my prayer is to you, O Lord. Let me be delivered from my enemies. Keep me from sinking. Uh, he, he draws this illusion back. He goes back to that original quotation, talking about drowning. And he, and he goes back to that. And says, Save me from drowning. Pull me out of the, of the deep muck that, I've, that, that I'm buried in. Uh, don't allow the flood to sweep over me. He does depart from that at the very end. He talks about, uh, don't let the pit close its mouth over. Don't let the grave close its mouth over me. I mean, it's another, it's another poetic way of speaking about the, the, the level of desperation that, he, that he's feeling. And he's praying to God in this, in this time of desperation. Save me, God, I plead to you. Uh, you. You haven't answered me yet, but I'm, I'm praying to you to answer me. Uh, <laughs> Nice preface. Uh, answer me, O Lord. Um, and, and clearly, the answer that David's looking for, you know, how does God answer prayer? He can answer yes, he can answer no, and he can answer also, mm, let's, let's wait a while. Those, those last two are not what David's looking for. David's looking for an answer, a positive, he's looking for God to intervene. He's looking for God to step in and, and stop this. You know, I am... I am I, I'm going down for the third time, God. Uh, you know, stop this. Help me. Save me. Uh, reach in. That's, that's his context. He's asking God, don't hide your face from me. Draw near me. Uh, make haste. Uh, redeem me. We talked a, a couple weeks ago about in the, in the Old Testament particularly, particularly, redeem has more the context of rescue than it does in the New Testament, the, con the, the context of, uh, of, of salvation. Uh, similarly. And then he speaks, You know my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. This is another verse that speaks about, he recognizes the things that he's done. You know my reproach, my shame, and my dishonor. Uh, the reproaches have broken my heart. I'm in despair. Uh, again, just another talking about the depth that he's in. I looked for pity, and there was none. They gave me poison for food, 
and for my thirst they gave me sour wine to drink. Now, this is not directly quoted in the New Testament, but it's, it's clearly a fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, they, in Matthew, d describing the crucifixion of Christ, uh, and, and I pulled out all, all the gospel accounts reference this, by the way, but out of Matthew it says, and when they uh, came to a place called, called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. So what is, what is gall? Well, gall is a, if I understand my biology correctly, it's a product of the liver. It was, a, it's, it was used as a medicine. In the Old Testament, the quote was, if I can go back there properly, they gave me poison. In some, in some versions, it's translated as gall. They gave me gall for food. They gave me poison for food. Uh, it was... In Mark, it gets called myrrh, and myrrh is the specific ingredient. Uh, gall is, as I understand, is a little more generic term that they used for uh, any of a variety of medicines they would give to dull the pain. And by custom, apparently for a Roman crucifixion, it was their custom to offer some kind of drink to, to help dull the pain. And later on in chapter 27, it talks about, and one of them... And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. Sour wine, what's that? Well, it's, it's, it's more vinegar than it, is, than it is wine. And it was apparently just a cheap, a cheap wine, a cheap drink that the soldiers would drink. And again, going back to Psalm 69, it's not a quotation, but it's clearly a fulfillment of what's being spoken of. They gave me poison for my food and for my first and for my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink um, and the crucifixion of Christ. Yeah, okay. So in this section of the psalm, David, his focus becomes, let your anger burn against them, God. He wants, David wants vengeance. Now keep in mind, David's still in the middle of this. He's not been rescued yet. He's writing this during during the depths of his, of his struggle, during the depths of his desperation. And his response is, let their own table before them become a snare and a trap. Uh, let their eyes be darkened. Let their loins tremble continually. Pour out your indignation upon them. Let your anger burn against them, God. May their camp be a desolation. Let no one dwell in their tents. For they persecute him whom you have struck down, and they recount the pain of those you have wounded. You know, I'm fascinated by verse 26 there. Um, there's no reference to it in the New Testament. And in the various things I've read leading up to this week, I can't find any particular uh, significance applied to verse 26 there. But to me, it sure seems to be a messianic prophecy. They persecute him whom you have struck down, and they recount the pain of those you have wounded. If, if, if Jesus is the one whom God has struck down, he is the one who's being persecuted. This is my own little idea. Uh, again, I haven't found any other references that, that would quote that, but uh, this is not a, uh, something I had noticed before and, and jumped out of it this time. Again, you know, gaining some of that appreciation of the Psalms, some insight into the Psalms that I hadn't had before. Uh, so uh, that occurred to me. But, but David's focus here is, is, is vengeance. God, pay back these people for what they've done. Let their names be blotted out from the book of the living. I mean, that's, that's really going deep, right? That uh, Don't count these people among the righteous. What's, what's a little interesting to me is comparing David's attitude to persecution because his cries for vengeance what was Jesus response to persecution Jesus response to persecution was father forgive them forgive them Lord Jesus had no less a level if you could arguably a much deeper level of persecution than David had uh, you can arguably that, that, that in the night in the garden, Jesus is feeling that same sense of drowning, that same sense of being overwhelmed. 
every bit of persecution that David had, but Jesus' response, and ultimately our guide, our guide as disciples of Jesus, his response to that persecution is, forgive them, God. Forgive them. The rest of the passage goes on just to, just to highlight the level of wrong that was being done to Jesus by everybody. Uh, they cast lots to divide his garments. The people stood by, watching. And the ruler scoffed at him, saying, Save yourself if you are the Christ. Jesus' response is to forgive. So, brothers, sisters, as we're going out, being disciples, carrying the light, experience our own persecution, which will happen if we are carrying the light. Forgive. Forgive. That's what we're taught by our Lord. Forgive. There's also... uh, Paul also quotes this passage in Romans 11. Uh, in Romans 11, he, he quotes the, this, this entire passage, actually, let their own table before them become a snare and a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and let their loins tremble continuously. So how, do he, how does Paul use this? Again, he uses it in quite a different context. He's speaking of Israel. Um, and, and he's trying to explain, it's a, it's a difficult explanation, by the way. He spends three chapters explaining it about how Israel has not come to Christ, trying to explain why Israel is not responding to the Messiah that's been promised for generations and generations. Israel to, failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened, as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see, and ears that would not hear, down to this very day. I can't remember if that's in Deuteronomy or Isaiah, but... Then he goes on to quote from Psalm 69. And David says, Let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and bend their backs forever. So, it's, again, Paul's making a different point than David meant. David's asking for wrath on these people. When David asks for let their eyes be darkened, let their, let their, um, let their table become a snare and a trap, God you see that retribution is done. But Paul is using this to explain why is it that so few Christians have come? Jesus has become the stumbling block to them. Jesus has, it's according to prophecy, it's according to God's will, and as I said, it's it's a complicated explanation that he offers, but, but ultimately he's explaining this was part of God's will and Jesus has become the stumbling block. The most succinct explanation I could find was in Romans 9. So I just want to quote that just to try to better convey what Paul was, was explaining. But, then, but he's talking about the righteousness that the Gentiles have obtained. But the Israelites have failed to, to capture it. What shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. So they have stumbled over the stumbling stone. And what is the stumbling stone? Well, the stumbling stone is Christ. Paul's using this quote from Psalm 69 to explain that that it's become a, the law has become a snare and a trap for them. It's their eyes have become darkened so they can't see. The law has darkened their eyes to where they, they can't see and they're stumbling over Christ. That's the purpose that, that Paul used for here in Romans 11. We also have one other uh, uh, passage uh, and it's in, in the replacement of Judas Iscariot. Peter quotes this in Acts chapter 2. May their camp be a de- desolation. Let no one dwell in their tents. And if you look at this in, in Acts, oh, I beg your pardon, Acts chapter 1, uh, af- after explaining that, you know, what became of, of Judas, uh, Peter quotes, uh, for it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate and let there, no one, let there be no one to dwell in it, and 
let another take his office. I believe the let another take his office, I think that comes from Deuteronomy. Don't quote me on that. But in this quote, Peter's offering two different explanations. The one from 69 is explaining that Judas, uh, Judas' departure from Christ was predicted in prophecy. Judas' uh, leaving, turning his back on Christ, it was according to prophecy as per Psalm 69. May his camp be desolate, let there be no one to dwell in. That's what Peter is offering his explanation about why Judas did what he did. But then he goes on to quote this other one to say, yeah, but he needs to be replaced. And that was the justification that Peter uses to make it, to identify Matthias as the replacement. So we're going to wrap up here and close out. Uh, and this final couple of passages is just David's resolution to continue to pray God, praise God despite his affliction. The psalm is written, David's still in the middle of it. He's not out of this. I am afflicted and in pain. Let your salvation, God, set me on high. He's looking to the future. God, set me on high. So in the midst of this, he's still resolute in praising God and standing by God. I will praise the name of God with a song. You who seek God, let your hearts revive. Let heaven and earth praise him for seas and everything that moves in them. David's conclusion to this, to the, to the persecution, is not to fall away from God. His, his resolution is to, I'm going to stand firm. I'm going to trust in the God. I know he'll deliver me. I hate this persecution. This is terrible, but I'm going to stand firm. That's the message for us too. That, there, is no, there is no stronger message that I could ask you to take away from this whole study of Psalms. Be resolute. Be firm. Stand by God and trust that he will make it right. That's, that's come through in every one of the Psalms. That's what we've looked at. So, that's it. Um, I've enjoyed my little sampling uh, this, uh, this month. Uh, next week, uh, Chuck's going to start a really uplifting series on death and me. So, uh, <laughs> so, we'll see you next week.